чуть-чуть. Hello. Now the mic is on. Hello and welcome to this live chat uh, to celebrate 2000 subscribers on my channel. First and foremost, I have to thank you all for that because this is you, my viewers, that support me, that click the subscribe button. And many of you who are watching my videos still aren't subscribed, please do subscribe. This does not cost you anything, just one click of a mouse and it helps me tremendously. So thank you again. Today I'm going to talk maybe briefly about a couple of different topics. Not so very much serious, but maybe just in general. First, I want to show you stats on my channel. Uh, because this is about my channel. This is about a thousand subscribers. So as you can see, most of my subscribers are from the United States. A little bit more than 40%. I guess this is because of uh, United States being the biggest audience for YouTube and also me speaking English on this channel. And the idea of this channel is to promote history, culture and situation in Russian Christianity worldwide. And English is the best channel to do that. So no surprise that most of my subscribers and viewers are from the United States. You're all very welcome. The second largest is United Kingdom, then Canada, then Australia, then India. All of these countries are predominantly or traditionally English speaking. Well, with India, it's much more complicated, but we're not going there. Second, as I've just said that most of my viewers are not subscribed, 90% and a half. Please subscribe if you watch my videos, if you find them useful, if you find value in them because this helps me tremendously and it does not cost you anything. Just one click of a mouse. Thirdly, the interesting, fascinating statistics about gender and age, as you can see on your screens, the, my viewers are predominantly male, 92.3% and 7.7% .7 female. I don't know what that is. Obviously, the YouTube is generally much more male than female in terms of viewership traditionally, but also the difference is just too huge on my channel. So apparently these topics are more interesting for, for men than for women. I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> if, you have, if you have ideas, drop them somewhere in the comments. I will be glad to, to address them. So I don't know if it's good or bad. It just is. So. Uh, another important uh, thing is age. So from 18 to 34 is my main audience. The younger people, although the older people watch me too, which is good and everybody is welcome. Again, I don't know what to make of it. Just funny stats that I would like to share with you. So if you have ideas what to do with the stats, maybe you think I should address more topics that are interesting to older people or to women or to other countries, or you think it's fine just the way it is, your suggestions are welcome. Okay, next. Of course, if you have questions right now, drop them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer if I can. Uh, third, uh, the important stuff about what's going on in the world in Russia with Russian Christianity. So for those of you who are new to my channel, I just want to list the most important stuff to understand. If you forget everything I'm talking about on this channel, just remember several things, maybe three or four major things. The first one is the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church is not the church. He is a very important figure. He symbolically represents the church. He expresses the opinions of the church loudly. At least he pretends to, but he is not the whole church. The whole church is more than 100, well, uh, more than 1000 years old. It's ancient. It is huge. It is enormous. It's absolutely multifaceted. And uh, as I say, it's more of an umbrella than an organization because under this umbrella, you can find whatever educational institutions, 
different groups of people, of different people. You can find casual believers who don't know much about their church. You can find devoted believers in different ways. Some ascetic, some monastic, some clergy, some lay people living different lives, believing in different things within reasonable limits, holding different political positions, uh, representing different cultures, even speakers of different language, all under the umbrella of the Russian Orthodox Church. So the Church Patriarch, whatever you like him or not, whether you like him or not, whether you agree with what he's saying or, or not, whether you agree with some things or, or not other things, he does not represent the whole Church other than symbolically, clerically, hierarchically. But he does not represent the opinions of the whole church, whether you like them or not. And he does not represent every, each and every one who belongs to the church in one way or another. This is a very important thing. So when the Russian Orthodox Church is criticized, uh, judging by the opinions of the patriarch, this is wrong. When the Russian Orthodox Church is praised, judging by the opinions of the patriarch alone, this is wrong too. Even Patriarch and his bishops, and his bishops may have different opinions or different varieties, different details within these opinions, different uh, ways of looking at things and viewing things when it comes to faith, society, culture, or everything else. So it is important to understand that the Russian Orthodox Church is a huge, complex, multifaceted, and a very ancient body which cannot be represented by one man, even if he is a very important, charismatic and influential leader. So this is one thing to understand. The second thing which is mo most important about the Russian political system in general. Many people think of the Russian politics as one Genghis Khan on top of it, Genghis Khan-like figure named P Vladimir Putin and everyone else. This does not work this way. This never worked this way, especially with such a, an enormous country as Russia, the biggest in the world uh, in territory and quite significant in population, although not as big. So this will never work this way. There are different interest groups, lobby groups uh, representing heavy industry, military complex and natural oil, natural gas and so on and so on and so forth. And they oftentimes have conflicting interests. So the task of the leadership, whether it's Putin or Putin and his advisors, his ministers and his other different people working with him, his administration, their main task is to balance out different interests of different groups. Whether he's doing that in autocratic way, uh, suppressing uh, civic, civic liberties, freedoms and so on and so forth or not, Anyways, he's not a Genghis Khan-like figure, and I believe in the Genghis Khan time, he was not only the only leader. Anyways, we just remember him alone. So this is this uh, another another important part is that the political power in Russia consists of three main levels, and these levels also have conflicting interests, as it can be seen, for instance, during the election. During the elections, the top level. Uh, wants elections to be mm, more transparent than the lower level because for the top level knows that they're winning anyways. Anyways, the majority of the population supports the, the Putin and his uh, United Russia party and everyone he promotes. So they know they're going to win in landslide anyways. But the lower levels want to show their uh, loyalty, their support and to show better numbers that the neighboring region. So these three levels is the federal level, where we have the president, the parliament, and the ministers, the government, and the courts, the Supreme Court, the constitutional courts. Then we have the regional level, where we have regions, which are now um, more than 80 in Russia, including republics, and three, as far as I remember, because it changes all the time, three cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and occupied, uh, annexed Sevastopol in Crimea. And we have republics, 
and we have different kinds of regions with their heads. They're usually called either a president if it's a republic or they're called the governor if it's something else. And uh, when it comes to Moscow, the Moscow head calls, called a mayor, just traditionally. There is no logic in that. And there is a local level. All local levels, are the heads of administration could be called mayors or something like that, but on paper they are called all heads of administration. And those local levels are towns or cities or villages or like counties, if you call them in English, regions, like city districts even. So these local levels are, are the lowest, then the regional level and then the federal level. And these levels, as I've already said, can have conflicting interests. And the same applies to the church because the church developed for almost a thousand years together with the state. So they have the same three levels. On the top, federal level, we have the patriarch, the holy synod, and the councils, the big councils, which is the main like decision-making body. And then on the regional levels, we have regional um, eparchies headed by bishops. And depending on the size and importance of the eparchy, a bishop can be a metropolitan or archbishop or just bishop. So different, different names, different ranks. But this is the regional level. And on the local level, we have either parishes or monasteries, with some exceptions, because some monasteries are subject directly to the patriarch, but that's a de already detail. So if we forget about it, the, the, on the local level, we have either parish with the parish priest or a monastery with uh, the hegemon or in the female monastery, a mother superior. So all these are lame translations from Greek or Russian. So this is an important thing. Also three levels with conflicting interests because uh, the parish priest works with the lay people directly. And the bishops, the bishops accumulate power in their bigger region and respond to the Moscow leadership. And the Moscow leadership is strategic. They work for the strategy of the whole church. They work for the image of the whole church. They represent the church. But again, they are not the church. They are just one important level of the church. So this is an important thing. The third important thing you should understand if you forget everything else that I said is Russia is way too complex. It's much more complex than most people think of it. Let's start with uh, my favorite example. So amongst all Christian nations, and I use Christian loosely, so whatever you think of as a Christian state, a Christian country, traditionally called a Christian country, whether you think the US is a Christian country or not, whether you think the UK is a Christian country or not, or for instance, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, and so on and so forth. So imagine all the countries that you consider Christian, if you consider Russia Christian as well. Russia has the biggest Muslim population of them all, sometimes combined, depending on who you count. So the Muslim population of Russia is from 7 to 16 percent, according to different different censuses, different methodologies of counting, because some regions, some big Muslim regions that belong to Russia for hundreds of years, like Tatarstan and Dashkartostan, they have the Muslim majority, which can be as casual as the majority of Russian Orthodox. So they may identify as Muslims as a part of their uh, ra national or ethnic identity or cultural background and not being as devoted and uh, and practicing. So these uh, Muslims in different regions, there are different uh, movements, different Muslim uh, movements. There are Sunni Muslims, there are Shi'i Muslims. Sometimes they have little to no fellowship with each other. There is the Northern Caucasus region full of different Muslim regions and republics and, and regions. So it's very complicated. And there is also a huge migration from the Central Asia, from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and so on and so forth, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan, also traditionally Muslim majority countries. So the, mass, the number of Muslims, I, I believe you can f safely say that the, every 10th Russian would be Muslim uh, on average. Um, this leads me to the next point that uh, Russia is 
according even to the official propaganda, official ideology, constitution, whatever, legislature, but in practice, this is true. Russia is multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-language country, and multi-religious as well. There are all sorts of peoples you can find, and even different races. So traditionally, on Russian territory, uh, there were at least uh, two races represented, so white Europeans and, and Asians. There are lots of people, uh, in the, usually in the north, in Siberia, speaking Altaic, Finno-Ugric, uh, Turkic languages, and may, maybe different other languages, nomadic, uh, uh, nomadic herders, and um, all sorts of people who are uh, racially either mixed or Asian. And there are all sorts of other, other um, ethnic origins in different parts of Russia, speaking all sorts of different languages and so on and so forth. And which is um, one thing is very important to understand that Ukrainians constitute sometimes, the, according to the census and to methodology again, sometimes they constitute the second largest ethnic minority in Russia after Russians themselves, sometimes like third uh, after Tatars, traditionally Muslim, or depending on the census. So the last census showed them an eighth place, but it was uh, held in 2021, if I remember correctly, and already almost uh, the war with Ukraine almost started, and uh, there was quite problematic to, call, to identify as Ukrainian in Russia back then. So I believe many people of mixed background or even Ukrainian background uh, just opted for a different option. Speaking Russian as their first language, for instance, they, they decided to identify as Russian, to have less problems in life maybe, or feeling somehow emotional towards Ukraine. Who knows? But traditionally, Ukrainians showed the second or the third place among ethnic minorities in Russia. Another uh, just logical continuation of that, that among different various religions of all sorts that are spread across Russia. All Abrahamic religions, obviously, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish, uh, and uh, all sorts of pagan religions, Buddhism, whatever you can think of. Uh, Christianity is very diverse in Russia as well. Of course, there is the dominant, the majority church, Russian Orthodox, and uh, they constitute up to 60 maybe 70, but I don't really believe that, percent of the population. But those people are just, if you ask them on the street, do you identify as an Orthodox? And they say yes, and that's it. But if you, uh, if you apply any stricter criterion to this, maybe how often do you go to church, or do you read the Bible, or do you pray, or do you partake of um, sacraments, anything of that kind, then this number significantly drops to 5% to 3%, depending on the question you ask. And uh, there are other churches, other Christian communities. Some of them have been present in Russia for centuries, some for maybe hundreds of years. Uh, evangelical Christians, for instance, uh, first appeared in 1860s and emerged, and they were all predominantly local Russian converts, not necessarily ethnically, because Russia is multi-ethnic, but culturally and legally Russians, Russian speakers. So, uh, and there are Catholics and uh, different mainline Protestants like Lutheran, uh, which used to be predominantly people of a foreign background, Lithuanians, Polish, and uh, Latvian and Finnish and Estonian and so on and so forth. But nowadays, all these churches have a lot of a lot of uh, Russian converts, and some of them even predominantly consist of local Russian converts. And I'm still thinking of whether I'm capable of doing a video on Russian Catholics because this is definitely lacking on my channel now. Well. And also uh, a detail which is directly related to the war in Ukraine, that Russia nowadays has no officially recognized Western border. There, are, there is an internationally recognized Western border of Russia, which used to be the border before the annexation of Crimea, before 2014. And this is the border that 
most of the countries on earth recognizes the Russian border. But since uh, the annexation of Crimea and then the start of the uh, war in Ukraine in 2022, Russia captured some territories and claimed them as her own. And there was an official ceremony in, uh, in 2023 to accepting, adopting these territories into Russian Federation. But even from the current Russian legislature, there is no clarity where the western border of Russia is because Russia claims certain Ukrainian regions, but a big parts of these regions is still control are still controlled by Ukraine. And Russia does not make a clear cut claim where the, her claims end and where the border is. So there is no Western border clearly defined in the Russian legislature nowadays, which is quite unusual and quite problematic. All right. So talking about the future of this channel, um, of course, I welcome suggestions on what I should do videos on and what I should, I should not discuss and everything. I, I am grateful for all suggestions and for everything, for all your comments, questions and uh, suggestions. However, uh, there is one general principle how I decide what this video is going to be about and what in this video the approach I'm going to take and what I'm going to include, what I'm not going to include. And this principle is quite simple. Whatever I feel like interesting and whatever I feel like I am competent on. Because the if I do not think it is interesting, then I'm not going to make a video on it. Because if I make videos on something that is not interesting to me, the video is going to suck. Also, if I'm not, uh, if I don't feel competent in something, I'm not going to talk about it because the quality is going to be poor and I don't want poor quality videos. I'm not a world class expert in all and every each in, in each and every topic I discuss, obviously. In some of them I am, in some of them I am not, but I'm competent enough to make a YouTube video for a general public discussing the general, the introduction to the topic. So hence, please uh, take it as it is that this is, there are limits to my competence and limits to my interests as well. So since this channel is not a part of my paid work, I do whatever I like, but suggestions are welcome and I do it for you. Second, I try my best not to take sides, especially when it comes to faith claims. Whose faith is right? Whose faith is wrong? Whether this church is right or this particular preacher is right, predestination or I don't know whether there is hell or not, whether there is God or not, whether Jesus is the son of God or Jesus is a mighty prophet or Jesus is a mighty angel or Jesus he probably existed because the historical sources shows that he did. But when it comes to details, the faith claims, I'm not taking sides. I'm just telling the story. I'm showing you the facts. I'm trying to make some conclusions based on the facts. But again, I'm not taking sides. I don't know whether the Orthodox faith is authentic or there's any sort of Protestant faith is authentic, whether Jehovah's Witnesses are right, whether Catholics are right, whether Muslims are right, whether atheists are right. I don't know and I don't take sides. And uh, it also co concerns canonicity. So uh, let's take the case of Ukraine. There are at least three big Ukrainian Orthodox churches claiming to be the canonical one the one that represents uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian people in Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Well, one of them, the, the one that I made a video uh, recently, uh, headed by the patriarch of so-called Kievan Patriarchate, Filaret, that one is not recognized by anyone else on earth. And again, I don't know, maybe that's the true church. Who knows? God knows, I don't. And I don't, uh, I'm not an expert in a canon law. I just understand that the canon law is as easily interpretable as the Bible itself. So 
there is a collision of the canon law and some some uh, people communities churches and groups say that the canonical church is the church of the moscow patriarchate other people say that the newly founded uni unified church in 2018 is the canonical church because it is recognized by the constantinople patriarchate and the patriarch uh, but others say that no moscow if moscow didn't let go of the church of the moscow patriarchate then they are right with the canonicity i don't know god knows experts in canon law know but i don't and i don't take sides for me it is interesting the situation that is going on it's absolutely fascinating i the claims that they make and the practice because even though the ukrainian orthodox church of the moscow patriarchate for instance is by many considered to be the canonical church in ukraine they themselves are trying to distance themselves from moscow and again according to the canon law they have big problems with that so i'm interested in how the situation unfolds and i hope it does not leave lead to more violence than that already is so this is my position uh that's the position i try to take and i don't always succeed because i have my own understandings opinions and this is after all is not a research tool this is a youtube channel where i speak to the general public and i speak on more topics than i speak about in the academic setting in the academic setting i'm an expert in a certain narrow field which i represent in my conference talks publications and in my research work but here on youtube channel i speak on more general issues on many more issues i have like a wider circle of topics uh, and i i'm not necessarily a world-renowned expert in each and every one of them so bear with me <laughs> and uh, finally when it comes to not taking sides and personal opinions there is of course the war in ukraine the raging war in ukraine with much violence with much bloodshed on both sides and my position is clear it's not that i took the ukrainian side uh, but the position is just that the war itself is an atrocity in general war is the worst thing that can happen to humans it's the worst thing that you can think of it's the worst situation nobody wins in war usually everybody loses some lose more than others but currently the whole world is losing in one way or another and uh, every country the european union the us all lose some money all lose some lives of, of whoever volunteer to go there they all lose geopolitical interests and so on and so on and so forth and these two countries directly involved they lose hundreds of thousands of lives of young men twice my age so it is a great atrocity and another thing is which why people think that i am taking a side uh, my position is simple whether the us and nato provoked russia or not whether bombings in donbass with huge numbers of killed civilians uh, by ukrainian military is a true story or exaggerated or not true at all whether Zelensky and everyone on his uh, in his uh, government is bad drug addicted evil minded or not anyways invading a foreign independent country with a military is an atrocity and a war crime and there are more war crimes committed left and right so this is a tragedy this is a generational trauma for both countries and for many more around them and this is evil that's my position and if you consider it taken aside all right so be it okay i've said everything i wanted to say and i see some messages in chat which i address and then we conclude this stream First, Johnny Charles said that Christ is risen, Christos Vaskresi, and the Orthodox tradition requires me to respond, Vaistino Vaskresi, that he is risen indeed. 
Uh, I don't know if you speak Russian, Johnny, but <laughs> thank you for your comment and you're very welcome. Then my lovely wife says hi, hi, back to her. Uh, George, ah, George, sorry, uh, Romanian surname, <laughs> terribly sorry, Stefan Georgescu is saying basically the same, but in English, Christ is risen from Romania. Hi, back to Romania to you, Stefan. I hope I didn't butcher your surname too badly. Uh, and again, Stefan, what do you think about Patriarch Bertram, you personally? This is... <laughs> I actually don't. I don't know the guy so well. I know he has a much influence on Christianity and Russia and Russian Christianity, but this is somewhat outside of my competence. I don't know much about him, apart that he has been a patriarch for many, many, many long years, uh, record breaking almost. And he's personally involved in the conflict of uh, Christianity in Ukraine. And he's obviously he and his um, church is taken aside. That I can say for sure. What are his reasons? And and I don't. I'm not competent enough to answer this question, unfortunately. So yes, maybe you could find a specialist on on uh, Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Christianity and the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. Stefan again. Right now, two wars are of huge importance, Russia, Ukraine and Israel, Hamas or Palestine, depending on whom you ask. Yes, you are absolutely right. And those are not the only uh, military conflicts that are raging right now in the world. Th these are just the most present in the media and maybe with most caus causalities at the moment. Who knows? Yes, uh, all of it is tragic, all of it is generational, unfortunately. When it comes to the Middle East, again, it's, be, it's been going on for generations, and according to the holy books, it's been going on for thousands of years. So people just hate each other, and they have vendetta-like uh, revenge attitude to each other for thousands of years. So is there any peaceful solution? I don't know. Should I take a side, be pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, pro-Israeli, pro-Israeli um, military? No, this is very far from my home. Uh, this is uh, pretty far and beyond my competence, and I'm not taking sides. I can just say that if you are taking a side in a conflict, first it's good to be personally involved somehow. If you are Israeli, if you are Palestinian, if you have some personal, emotional or practical, family, political involvement in the conflict, it's okay to take a side. But when it's thousands of miles from your home and you know little to nothing about it and you go outside with a slogan and you protest and, for instance, uh, many people scream from the river to the sea without even knowing which river and which sea. So that, I think, is a little immature. And it especially shows that you have no real problems in your life if you cheer for something going on in thousands of kilometers with which you have nothing, no personal involvement. So, and this goes both ways. So it's not an anti-Palestine right uh, rant; it's anti-ignorant uh, protest rant. Okay. So, if there are no many, no more questions, I thank you all again for your support for 2,000 plus subscri subscriptions. And please, if you find value in what I do, do subscribe. And if you can share my videos, please share. And I wish you all a good evening or day, whatever you have. Greetings from Helsinki, Finland. And thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.